Hey everybody, welcome back to Winamat Hockey. Today we are talking about one of the original six teams in the National Hockey League, the one and only Detroit Red Wings, and what they need to do to turn their franchise around. This season they finished 19, 27, and 10. Not where you want to be, but they've got the six overall pick, $48 million in cap space, and a legend sitting in the general manager position. The future is bright, Detroit fans. If you're new to the channel, please be sure to subscribe. I've got Jake the Snake Armstrong and Matt the Brat Cleveland alongside. Stay tuned. All right, guys, hey, welcome to today's video. So let's get started here with the Detroit Red Wings and kind of recapping uh, the young talent that's on their roster and their pending RFAs and UFAs. And Jake and Matt, let's break down who we think Detroit is going to bring back because they've got a lot of guys that are young, like I just said, and have some developing to do, but they've been in the NHL, they've gotten some experience, there's some things that are looking pretty good over there in Detroit when you look five or six years down the road. So Jake, let's start with you. These signings are going to be interesting and crucial to Detroit's future. What RFAs and UFAs do you think they're bringing back? All right, so first off, you got to look at their UFAs that are old and who are most likely not coming back. The big one is Henrik Zetterberg hasn't played in several years. Congrats, you just made $6 million. Uh, Mark Stahl, they absorbed that contract. Uh, so that they could get other assets, and that was $5.7 million. Congrats, you made almost another $6 million. Darren Helm, 3.85 mil, I don't think they bring him back. Valtteri Filipula, 3 mil, he's 37 years old, he's not coming back. Uh, he'd break his hip. Luke Glendening, 1.8 mil, uh, that's iffy, but I don't see him coming back either. So that's their uh, notable UFAs. Bobby Ryan, almost forgot about him. I don't think he comes back. Uh, I, at this point, I see him doing like the Jason Spezza type thing, where he signed league minimum in Montreal, and that didn't work out. But I see Bobby Ryan doing the, doing the same thing. He'll sign with a cup contender at league minimum, just trying to win something and feel good about himself. Uh, other than that, Jonathan Bernier is a 32-year-old goalie, played really well for them. I don't think they bring him back, just because he's old. I think you get a little bit younger and prep for that future that they have coming up, uh, but more on that later. Uh, in terms of RFAs, uh, they've got a long list. So I think they bring back Tyler Bertuzzi, obviously, Jacob Brana, obviously. Michael Rasmussen, I think they bring him back. Christian Juice has not played very well, really, but I watched him with the Capitals, and I thought he was pretty good. Uh, it also helps that he had the best years of his career there, and I haven't really watched him as much in Detroit, but I think Detroit obtained him because they believe in him, so I think they'll bring him back. Uh, Adam Earn, I think they'll bring him back. Dennis Chalowski, they'll bring him back. Philip Peronik, Giovanni Smith, and Evgeny Svechnikov, they'll bring all of them back uh, just on their RFA deals. Uh, so yeah, that'll pretty much round out their, their young core that they have. Nice, Matt. Before we kind of go in and break down some of those key players that Jake just listed off, who do you think they bring back? Do you agree with Jake here, or are there a couple that you think, ah, oh, no, maybe they'll let him walk? Um... I agree with everything that he had to say about the RFAs. I think when you got young players like that, you want to keep them. Uh, the only place I disagree with is with Luke Glenn Denning. I think he's definitely a Stevie Asman type guy. I think he's a dude who could play the third or fourth line there. And he was a dude who was actually, surprisingly, top five in the league in faceoff. So he gets it done in the dot. Definitely a good guy to have on penalty kill situations. And I think he could really help out Dylan Larkin there and mentor him a little bit because Dylan Larkin was sitting around 49% in the dot. And that's not going to cut it for a top center. So keeping a guy like Luke Glendening would be an option for them, and he wouldn't be very expensive. But other than that, I agree with all the other free agents. Do you too, Matt, think that Detroit is going to move on from their goaltender in Bernier? Um, I have him as a maybe keep, and that's only if the, they felt like his decent season could get better from here. But um, he's definitely a dude who... Maybe doesn't warrant a big contract of free agency, but he's a guy who I think had a good enough season to where he could latch on somewhere else. But I'm I'm sure if they definitely wanted to not look somewhere else and keep a dude who has 
experience in their system, keeping a guy like Jonathan Bernier makes sense. I do think that Jonathan Bernier had a great year, and he'll have a job someplace. But you look at the other goaltender, it's Thomas Grice. He didn't have as good of a year, or maybe just around the same. But he signed for another year. So you almost have to keep him just because of that contract. And so I think they do still get that younger goalie, and Jonathan Bernier is just the odd man out. But he will have a job someplace. He had a .914 save percentage with the Red Wings. If you are a goalie for the Red Wings, you're just saying, hey, please, come shoot at me. Come walk past the zero defense and put up shots on me. And he had a great save percentage. He's going to have a job someplace. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, so uh, you mentioned Jacob Brand, right? Um, I'm just curious to know, and I think some other people are curious to know, what do you guys think that his contract might look like since he's an RFA? Do you think Detroit is saying, let's lock this guy up long, long term, or is he getting some shorter term deal? Jake, what do you think? All right, so Vrana is already 25 years old. You're at least want to give going to give him five years. He might want even more than that. I'd say he either goes for like a three years to get him to 28 and then signs for the long contract, or he's going to want that long eight-year contract now. Either way, five to eight years in that range. His last deal, he made 3.35. I believe the Capitals didn't think that they had the space to sign him, so he definitely wants a raise. Probably somewhere in the $6 million, somewhere around the Nuge contract, honestly. He'll look for something like that. I was about to ask if the Nuge contract would affect Brana's contract, so that's a coincidence. <laughs> Matt, what do you think? What kind of money and deal do you think Brana's getting from Detroit? Well, I do think he's got the balls in his court pretty much with how hot he was the end of the season. I think he showed he's a guy who can really carry their wingers there for the future. And he's going to be a guy who's going to be tailing a lot of money. I agree with Jake with the amount. I think it makes sense around the five to eight years. And I think around the news contract makes sense. But he's definitely a dude who is not going to get shortchanged. He's going to want to get paid. That makes a lot of sense. So, hey, speaking of paydays, and we're talking about a team in Detroit that has $48 million, let's transition over to the free agency market. Do you guys think that Detroit, since they have all this money, might go out and overpay to get some of these veteran guys that are really good and have proven themselves? Jake, what do you think? I personally think they're having a great time collecting high draft picks, and they don't need to win now. Their team is not ready to win now, so I don't think they sign anybody to win now. I think, if anything, they get some veteran guys just for veteran-style uh, leadership, just teach the young guys or maybe even just to reach the cap floor. They're not going to go after any big agents or pay any big free agents. Matt, what do you think? Do you think they're going to be a little hesitant to sign some people, or are they going to go out and spend some cash? I think a little hesitant in the fact of forwards and defensemen, but I do think they look towards a, their goaltender situation. I think they're done with Bernier. I do I do think it may, uh, if they wanted to, they could bring him back, but I think they want to go with a little bit of a younger guy, even though he's not really that old, a guy who can kind of grow with the core. And I look at a dude who, uh, for some reason, hasn't been re-signed there in the Islanders, and he's an RFA, so you're definitely going to have to pay a little bit for him. And uh, Ilo Sorokin, Sorokin there from the Islanders. I think he had a monster year in 22 games, uh 217 goal against average, and a 918 save for save percentage i mean he had a really good year for them and he's a dude who really doesn't make sense why he hasn't got re-signed yet but he's a guy who fits their core and another russian monster there in net like uh eisman had in vasileski and i think he's a dude who can really carry them in the back end and can really set in stone because when you look at a lot of the goaltender prospects that they have there's not many when you look at the draft there's really not a guy that sticks out as a dude that you'd want to grab as a surefire future goaltender so i think making a move like this yeah you're gonna have to give up something in compensation but i think it'll be worth it in the long run because i really like what Sir sorokin has to offer jake do you think that detroit would be willing to give up some of those draft picks that you were talking about earlier to go out and sign an rfa such as the stud goaltender from the islanders you know i think that that's actually a good pick from matt because if you look at the islanders they've also got sam and Varlamov. And he's signed for at least a few more years, right? So if somebody else offers Sheets Sororkin and the Islanders can't match it or don't feel comfortable matching it, they might just take that compensation because they have to. 
because the Islanders are still in win now mode. Like they can't go into rebuild and spend all the money on the young guys right now, like Sororkin. So I could see that happening. Uh, he had a great year uh, in his regular season this year. He had a .918 save percentage with a uh, 2.17 goals against average. Uh, and we know they just signed Grice, so it seems like they like former Islanders goaltenders. <laughs> nice, guys. Hey, awesome thoughts. I like uh, a lot of what you guys have to say there. I think, you know, Detroit, they're going to build with them young guys they have. I mean, all of them are super young, it seems like, 25 and under, 26 and under. I mean, even Dylan Mark, you know, 24 years old, and he's playing at a pretty high level. So it seems that that's the path they're going to take, and they may, they may make a splash in free agency. I don't know. We'll have to see. But I think your guys' thoughts there are uh, pretty accurate, that they're going to go draft-first mentality and stick with the guys they have and build around that core. So speaking of that, they're not going to do much in free agency. I mean, that's the thought on the table here. Uh, let's talk about the trade market, because that definitely could change some things over there in Detroit. Uh, do you guys have any trades that you think might happen over the offseason or could be a possibility? Matt, let's go to you first. I have one trade in particular. I think it's a dude who played over 18 minutes for him this year per game. And Danny DeKaiser. I think he's a guy with uh, five mil left on his contract for one more year. He's a guy that you could ship out the door and a team, a definitely contending team. This this trade could definitely happen during the trade deadline, but I think it could definitely happen during this offseason. And a guy, team I have in mind for him is the Vegas Golden Knights. I think their big weakness this year was really defending. I think that was a problem for them. Their defensive depth was very weak. I think uh, it really goes to show when it came to the playoffs, they didn't have enough guys in the back end that could really help them out. And I think they do go all in. I think they're kind of in panic mode because of uh, what happened with this playoffs, what happened the season before. They haven't been able to get over the hump. And I think they throw in a third round pick. And I think they throw in William Carche in this deal. William Carche, a guy who only played about eight minutes for them, was more of a third or fourth line guy, but he's still 26 years old. I think he's a guy that Detroit could want, could definitely deepen their wing room, which they don't, really have that many low guys who can play good defense for them on the back end. Most wingers they have are good snipers. So he's a guy who could fit in well here in Detroit and a guy that I think Stevie Eisenman would love to pick up. And I think it really bo boost both teams and then get the cap situation under the way for Detroit and really help out Vegas. So. Nice, Jake. What are your thoughts on Matt's trade proposal? Well, we know that Vegas isn't afraid to make moves on the back end, as they signed Petrangelo last offseason. Thanks for that. Uh, but for them to take on that, what, $5 million contract of DeKaiser, they'll, pro they'll probably have to get rid of Flurry, which I think is almost inevitable at this point. You can't keep Leonard and Flurry, especially as the choice between which one you want to play is going to keep getting more difficult. I think you have to make a choice and open up some cap space. And if they do, that could open up the room for that trade. I, for one, think that Detroit, they very well could trade to Kaiser in the offseason. I think they wait till the deadline to maximize the value on a team on the cusp. They'll sign that rental deal at the deadline, uh, probably some salary retained. And then I think it could be similar to the David Savard trade, whereas this year David Savard had zero goals, uh, Oh, actually, that might be playoff stats. Anyways, he didn't have a whole lot of, po a lot of points, uh, but DeKaiser this year had four goals, eight assists, 12 points, and he was a plus three on Detroit. So relatively a similar player to David Savard, who fetched a first-round pick. So I think if you wait till the deadline, you can get very, very good value for him, and you're not losing a whole lot, especially since you can keep your entire future. Nice, yeah. Jake, do you have any trade proposals up your sleeve? I do, actually. To Detroit, Braden Holtby, who's making $4.3 million. Uh, and he had a tough year this year, 0.889 save percentage, 3.67 goals against. But in 2018-19, which was two seasons ago, 0.911 save percentage, 2.82 goals against. So much, much better. He's a great goalie. He won a cup for the Capitals. Uh, I think they give him up in exchange for a second-round pick, and Evgeny Svechnikov, who is a very low-risk, high-reward potential player. Uh, but that second rounder, I think, is pretty fair value for goaltenders who don't get a whole lot anyways. 
So I think that would be enough to get it done for Vancouver to clear up that goaltending situation. Yeah, Matt, uh, what do you think about Holtby coming into town? I know that you mentioned the signing over from the Islanders to cure Detroit's goalie problem. Uh, how do you think Holtby would fit in over there in Detroit if that deal were to get done? Well, if that deal were to get done, that would have meant that they wouldn't have went after Sorokin in the first place because I don't think they make that trade if they have Sorokin. But anyway, if they were to go ahead and pick up Holtby, I think it makes sense. The, um, the only thing I kind of hold back on is uh, they have two goaltenders who are coming off pretty awful seasons sitting there in net, and I think... If you're a defenseman, it's kind of hard to get excited about, especially some of these young defenses, get excited playing in front of two dudes and Grice and Holkby who really didn't have a big success. Maybe that's a little harsh on those two guys, but I mean, it's really, it's an interesting one. I will say it's an interesting trade idea. We'll see. Do you okay. think that Holtby's would be able to kind of bounce back over there in Detroit during this rebuild phase that they're going through? That is the that is a little bit of a pickle. I, I think coming off of the season that he had with Vancouver, I mean, Vancouver is one of their big situations. Their defense was not very good. And when you're looking at it from Detroit's perspective, is their defense any better? And I think a big contributor to the bad season Holtby had was that he had nobody in front of him. I mean, yeah, maybe he ha may not have had that good of a year uh, in his own in his own effort, but really that came down a lot to the defense. And I think getting moved over to a team with a bad defense as well, I think is not going to bode well for Holkby. I mean, maybe it bodes well for Detroit. It makes sense for Detroit, but for a guy like Braden Holkby, would you really like? I know, I don't know if he'd have much say in the trade, but I definitely think he did, wouldn't like playing in Detroit. That would be one thing I'd see. Jake, do you have any thoughts to that? Uh, you mentioned the team not being very excited to have two goaltenders coming off rough seasons, which they did have rough seasons, but I mean, if I'm on Detroit and I'm a young guy and I'm saying I get to play with a Stanley Cup champion, like backing me up in net, I'm excited about that. Uh, not to mention, uh, Sorokin's a good goalie, but he could also have the same effect that Holtby had. Holtby kind of fell off a bit after Barry Trott's system left to go to the Islanders. And now Sorokin gets to play under that system, and he's playing well. And before that, Grice got to play under that system, and he was playing well, and he fell off a bit when you go to the Red Wings. So I think whichever they choose between Sorokin and Holtby, they could see a bit of a slump after that, but I think you'd assume the same risk whether you go for, as you said, Sorokin or Holtby. But between the two of them, I'm going with the proven goaltender who won a Stanley Cup. I think it's going to be interesting if... If they were to trade for Braden Holpe, I mean, there's risk-reward here. Holpe could come back and play like that Stanley Cup champion that he used to be, or he's going to play like he did in Vancouver and struggle. It might take him a few years to get back to the goaltender that everyone knew him as. So, I mean, there's risk-reward there, and I think that if you're Detroit, maybe you take the risk. I don't know. That's something that uh, Steve Eisman will have to figure out and uh, make that decision before too long. Also, Holpe's only got a few years left, so the core is still going to be pretty young if it doesn't work out. If it works out, great. Resign him a couple more years. If it doesn't, pretend it never happened, get rid of him, find somebody else. And would you say the same for Sorokin, too, if that didn't work out with that signing? Uh, with Sorokin, you're going to have to sign a much longer contract because you're basically stealing him from the Islanders. You're going to have to win him over. If you traded for Holtby, as Matt said earlier, he doesn't really get a say. That's true. That is true. All right, so hey, we've got to broken down the entire roster here. We talked about Detroit's RFAs. They're basically going to bring all of those young guys back, let a couple of the maybe the heavier contracts or the uh, older guys walk, depending on you know what Eisenman decides to do over there. Uh, we've pulled out that free agency is probably not going to be the way that Detroit's going to go during this offseason, but they might. There's that possibility, but we've decided ultimately that they're probably going to pass on that, at least for the most part. And then trades. We've talked about Holtby coming in. Uh, Matt, can you recap what your trade was? I'm blanking here. Uh, DeKaiser for a third and William Cartier. Oh, yeah, that's right. So a couple of trade options that we've broken down to. So say that these things happen. Who do you guys have being the most valuable player next season for the Detroit Red Wings? Matt, how about you? 
I have a dude who did not have a great season this year, but I do believe in him, and I think he's going to play a lot of minutes on that back end. And Phil Peronic. I know it's kind of a shock pick, especially with a guy like Dylan Larkin on the roster, but I think he's going to play a lot more minutes this year. I think he's going to be definitely a lot healthier. He did miss a couple games with injury. And uh, I really like his stuff. I think he's a really good two-way guy. He's a dude who's good on the back end, and some of his um, – Ratings, some of his course eye ratings really show that he's a good player. It's just with the amount of minutes that he was logging last year, it made some of his statistical defensive stats look bad. But I think he's a guy who could really bounce back for them. And I think he's a huge part of their future on that back end with guys like him and Mort Sider. Those are two of the top defensemen for the future. And I think he's going to have a good season for them. I really do. Jake, how about you? Who do you think is going to be the most valuable player for Detroit next season? Unofficially, Steve Eiserman is the most valuable person in that entire organization. You look at the Lightning right now. He built those that team that won potentially two cups now, made it to back-to-back -back finals. That's his team. I know some people say, well, their new GM made all these moves to get him back. No, he brought in David Savard. This is Steve Eiserman's team. Anyways, uh, outside of Eiserman and the GM, the most valuable person to lace up skates next year will be Dylan Larkin. He just got the C at the beginning of the year. And I know it's kind of a cop-out because it's Dylan Larkin. He's the most well-known player on the team. But at the same time, he had a terrible year this year. So I think if you look at that team, somebody who has to make a difference is their captain, Dylan Larkin. And I think he will. Nice. That, that's a pretty solid pick. And I think a lot of Detroit fans out there are going to agree with you. I think a lot of people are going to say, Brandon, and Matt, I like your pick as well. Uh, but I have to say Tyler Bertuzzi. I think that that is a guy that he can break out. Uh, he played pretty well for them last year before going down with an injury. I think Jake, uh, this goes hand in hand with uh, Dylan Larkin here, like you said. I think if Larkin plays well, Bertuzzi is going to play well and vice versa. But man, I think he has got some special talent and I think he has some skills and moves that he has yet to show and I think he's going to be a great player for Detroit in the long run and I think he's going to break out this next season. So on that note, we have a young Detroit team heading back over into the Atlantic Division where it can get very competitive. So where do you guys think Detroit is going to end up in their division next year in the standings? Jake, let's come back to you. I have them in sixth. So they're not dead last thanks to a couple of really bad teams in that division. But they're not a playoff team quite yet. I think they've still got several years of development and just growth. But I think that the team overall, they understand that and they're okay with it. Whereas in Buffalo, it's erupting because the players don't want to be there anymore. They're tired of losing. I think in Detroit, they're all just kind of hanging out, trusting the process. And I think that they can build with that. So I think for now, sixth, but bright, bright future ahead. Mm -hmm. I also have them at sixth place for very similar reasons. I think there are a couple other teams such as Buffalo. And I only mentioned Buffalo because we did make a video about them. Be sure to go check that out if you haven't already. I think that, you know, uh, Buffalo is going to probably still be at the bottom of that division next year. So I think Detroit has a shot to make some improvements in the standings and finish at six, just as well for the same reasons that you mentioned, Jake. Matt, how about you? Where's Detroit finishing for you next season? I have them finishing in the seventh spot, but I think it is neck and neck between them and Ottawa. I think they're two very similar teams, teams that are uh, very young. And still need a lot of time to grow. They're not complete dumpster fires like Buffalo, so that's a plus. But uh, they're on the right track, and I think Detroit is definitely on the right track with a guy like C.V. Eisman at the helm. It's not going to be long before they're going to be fighting for wild card and then fighting for division titles. So, um, yeah, they just continue the process and keep it going. And, yeah, I think they'll continue to success. Awesome, guys. Hey, is there anything else that we that I have forgot to bring to the table and mention? Do you guys have any questions, concerns that we need to address before we wrap up this video? Question for you guys and the audience. Speculation. Who has a better year next year, Anthony Mantha or Jacob Brown? Matt, I'll let you take this one first. Anthony Mantha. I think that's 100% Anthony Mantha. I think uh, with a guy like that, I do like the potential of Jakob Verana. I think he could be a star for Detroit. But I think when you look at Anthony Mantha, I think his caliber of players that he's going to be playing with is going to really accelerate his production because he's going to be in a lot more 
goal creating situations. But when you look at a guy like Yekka Verona, he's pretty much going to have to do a lot of it on his own unless he's playing with Dylan Larkin. And even that, I mean, is really only one guy you can look forward to to create for you. And when you're a guy like, when you're two dudes who really rely on playmakers to help you out, it really comes down to who you play with. And I think in that case, Anthony Mantha is going to have the upper hand there. Matt, that is a pretty good point. Um, I was thinking Verano right out the get-go because I think that uh, what we saw out of him at the end of last season was pretty impressive. And personally, I think he's only going to continue to get better. I think he's going to get that contract we were talking about earlier. And I think that he's going to have a good season next year for Detroit. But you do raise a very good point with Mantha playing with the Washington Capitals. That can definitely help him uh, produce like we've seen in the past and even better than we've seen in the past. Jake, you, you begged the question here. What are your thoughts? Uh, you know, Matt brings up a good point with Mantha, especially since he'll have more time to learn the system. At the point that he came in, you sort of have time to learn how to play the way the team wants you to play. But it's a two-way street, really. The team has to learn where you play best. And they didn't have as much time to figure that out, which is why I think he slipped off towards the end of the year. If they can get that figured out, he's going to be a great goal scorer for them. Not so much on the defensive end, but offensively, great add. I still think Jacob Vrana is just an awesome uh, offensive threat. Just the speed that he has. He's just got that next generation type skill where he can speed past the defense and get a dangerous chance. So I think Vrana still has the better year. All right. Hey, we'd love to hear from all of you guys. Uh, drop your answer in the comments, Vrana or Mantha, who is going to have the better season next year? We'd love to hear from you. Hey guys, thank you again for tuning in to another video of Winamac Hockey. Please be sure to leave us a thumbs up and subscribe. We will see you next time.